I felt as though I was walking around with a box full of puzzle pieces under my arm all the time. And at least a third of the pieces were missing. People I've met through Parker Hill, the friendships that I've forged in Parker Hill are incredible. Right out of the gate, I was hooked. From the people that greet you at church to the message that was given, I was like, wow, this actually hits home. I can relate to these people. I'm not the only person who is struggling with things. Just can't stop uh, serving and love serving. Playing with the band and music is a big part of my life and uh, really hones you into uh, where you are with your walk in God and kind of just keeps you on the straight and narrow. I, I don't even know if I could have understood it or comprehended it myself without the kind of people that I was able to and fortunate enough to be surrounded by being involved in Bible studies and groups within this church. We're just trying to paint a picture of what the church could be and what it would, would look like to be a church that really is attractive to people. Because, you know, when Jesus walked here on this earth, people were attracted to him. Even some of the most irreligious people of his day were drawn to him. And so we figure if people were attracted to Jesus, they ought to be attracted to his people. And we're crazy enough to think that a church can be a place, and this church can be a place, where people can honestly say, I love my church. And I think one of the best paragraphs I've ever seen in writing about the potential of the church comes from a book on leadership written by a guy named Bill Hybels. And he says this, there's nothing like the local church when it's working right. Its beauty is indescribable. Its power is breathtaking. Its potential is unlimited. It comforts the grieving and heals the broken in the context of community. It builds bridges to seekers and offers truth to the confused. It provides resources for those in need and opens its arms to the forgotten, the downtrodden, and the disillusioned. It breaks the chains of addiction, frees the oppressed, and offers belonging to the marginalized of this world. Whatever the capacity for human suffering, the church has a greater capacity for healing. No other organization on earth is like the church. Nothing even comes close. And I would agree with that, but let me point you to a key phrase here in the very first sentence where he says this, there's nothing like the local church when it's working right. And today I want to talk to you about one of the most common reasons why churches often in our culture today are not working right. Now, let me help you understand two very different attitudes that people have when it comes to their experience with church, two different mindsets that people have as they enter into a church experience. And the first mindset, the first attitude is well represented, I think, by this, this bib. I'll be wearing this next Sunday as I watch the Super Bowl and eat my wings, and then I'll save it till I'm 85 and actually need it. But, you know, people who wear a bib and, and have the mindset of the bib, these are people who come to church and they expect the church to give them everything they need and to take care of them and to feed them and to encourage them and, and to, the church exists for their benefit solely. And, and people who, who wear the bib, they want to go to church, but they don't want to be the church. Like they want to receive from the church, but they don't want to give back anything. And, and if something happens that they're not happy with, they sometimes begin to cry and throw a bit of a temper tantrum. I've seen it happen. Now, that's one mindset that people have when it comes to church, but then there's another mindset that people have. And unfortunately, I would say that this mindset is, is very much the minority in churches in our culture today. And that mindset is represented by this. This is an apron. You see, people who come to church and engage with church with an apron kind of mindset, they are people who don't mind getting their hands dirty. They're people who want to serve and give back and be a part of something bigger than themselves, people who don't mind using their time and their talents and their energy and their resources to construct something of significance with their lives. And so the question is this, will you be a person of the bib? Or will you be a person of the apron? Now, let, let me just say something very quickly. See, an, a, a bib is not a bad thing. Um, sometimes you have to wear the bib if you're a baby. 
See, we all started out here, didn't we? I mean, when we were kids, probably most of us had a bib that our mom put on us when we were eating. But here's the hope of every parent. The hope of every parent is that your child will eventually outgrow the bib and begin to take on more and more responsibility and do things like get a job and move out on their own. And the same thing is true spiritually. You see, all of us at some point start out not having all the answers as you know, people who are at the very beginning of our spiritual journey, very young in the faith, and so there are times at the very beginning of our, our, our spiritual journey when we ha- kind of have to wear the bib, when we need others to give to us. But here's our hope for every person who calls this their spiritual home. Our hope is this, that eventually you'll take off the bib and you'll wear the apron. Because I want you to listen to what Jesus said about himself in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. He says this, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. If I were to paraphrase that, I would paraphrase it this way. The son of man did not come to wear a bib, but to wear an apron. You see, the real mark of spiritual maturity is when you take off the bib and you put on the apron. Because children wear bibs and expect to be served. Adults wear aprons, or wear aprons because they have learned the value of serving others. So my question again is this, when it comes to your church experience, do you have the mindset of the person who wears the bib or the person who wears the apron? Now let me tell you the fourth reason, this is the fourth week in this series, so let me tell you the fourth reason why I love my church. I love my church for this reason, because it's not about me. It's not about me. I want to be a part of that kind of church. And this is so counterintuitive, especially in our culture. What we often don't understand is that real joy and real fulfillment comes not from being the center of the universe, but from giving our lives to something bigger than ourselves. And I want to be a part of a church that's not about me. There was a Nobel Prize winning writer at the turn of the century whose name was George Bernard Shaw, and he said it so well. He said this, this is the true joy in life, being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, being thoroughly worn out before you're thrown on the scrap heap, being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little clot of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. And this culture will do its best to turn you into a selfish clod of grievances, expecting the world to, re- to revolve around you. But your heavenly Father, if you're a follower of Christ, wants something more for you. He wants to give you a greater purpose and in the process, give you greater joy. And one of the reasons I love my church is because we have a culture of servanthood around here. We have so many people who choose to wear the apron instead of the bib. I mean, we just added up the numbers. We have 600 people right now who are actively involved in serving in some way in this church. And let me tell you this. When you get a church full of people who choose to wear the bib, who choose to wear the apron instead of the bib, people who are willing to serve, when you get a church full of people like that, that is compelling. That is attractive. That is a church where people begin to say, you know what, I love my church. Today, I want to focus your attention in the Bible to an example that Jesus gave of what it looks like to be a servant. So if you have a Bible, either on an app, on your phone, or on your lap, you can open it to John chapter 13, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, fourth gospel. Uh, John was written by one of the closest followers of Jesus, and here in John chapter 13, he describes the events that took place on the night before the crucifixion. Jesus and his disciples are, are gathered together in a borrowed room. They're having one last meal together. And you're probably familiar with this story if you grew up in, in, in church. As they're having this meal, Jesus just kind of stops everything. He kneels down and he washes the feet of his disciples and gives a profound lesson about what true leadership and true greatness looks like in God's kingdom. If you uh, have, a, have a bulletin with you, there's a note sheet inside. You can take that out as well. Use that as a place to follow along and write some things down. And I, I want to focus, first of all, on just the first three verses and point out some background information that helps us understand the circumstances surrounding this event. Because when you understand these things, then this act of servanthood is even more profound. When Jesus walked into the room that night, there were three things that he knew. Number one, he knew this. He knew his future. Verse 1, 
It was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Let me stop and reread something. It says, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. And that sounds simple, that sounds very matter of fact, but think about what that meant for him. To leave this world and return to the Father meant that within the next 24 hours he would be betrayed and arrested and subjected to an unfair trial and he would be mocked and he would be beaten and he would be crucified. And he would undergo all of that in the process of leaving this world and returning to the Father. And verse one tells us that he knew that. And my point is this, I would suggest to you that if there was ever a time in his life, humanly speaking, When he had a right to be preoccupied with himself, this was that time. And as I was reading this, I couldn't help but ask myself, if I were walking into that room that night, knowing everything that he knew, what kind of attitude would I have? What kind of spirit would I have? I think I'd be preoccupied. I'd be a little bit on edge. And I certainly wouldn't be concerned with anybody except for myself at that moment. But Jesus loved and served his disciples even knowing what the next 24 hours would hold for him. He knew his future. Second thing he knew was this. He knew his disciples. Verse 2 says, The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus, which provides a striking contrast here. Jesus is getting ready to serve others. Judas is getting ready to serve himself. He had already decided in his heart that he would strike a deal with the religious leaders and betray his master, his rabbi, for 30 pieces of silver. Now here's the question. And on every campus you can answer this right out loud. loud. Did Jesus know that Judas would betray him that night? Did Jesus know that, yes or no? Yes, he did. In fact, verse 11 states it very, very clearly. A little bit later in the passage, it says he knew who was going to betray him. Let me ask you a second question. Did Jesus, when he went around the circle washing the feet of his disciples, did he wash the feet of Judas? Yes, he did. You know, if I had been in that situation, I don't know if I could have done that. Or maybe I would have washed the feet of Judas, but somehow in the process I might have broken one of his toes. I don't know. But Jesus knew what was in his heart and washed his feet anyway. It's incredible. In fact, he knew what was in the hearts of all of those disciples. He knew Peter would deny him three times. He knew Thomas would doubt his resurrection. He knew all of them at the point of his arrest, all of them would run and desert him in his hour of greatest need. And yet, even knowing all of that, he chose to wash their feet. He chose to serve them anyway. See, it's not hard to be nice to nice people. It's not hard to love the lovely. It's not real difficult to serve people who you know are going to serve you back. It's tough to serve people who will give you nothing in return. Jesus knew his future. He knew his disciples. There was one more thing that he knew. Verse 3 says this, He knew his position. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. In other words, he understood exactly who he was. He understood that he was the one who held the ultimate position of authority and power, not just in that room, but in the world. And yet, he chose to serve. He knew his future. He knew his disciples. He knew his true position And what I want you to understand is this, that from a human perspective, again, he had every excuse to not serve those around him. He had every excuse simply to focus on himself. It would have been very easy for him to say, from a human perspective, for him to say, you know what, I've just got too much on my plate right now. I just need to take care of me right now. I can't really be concerned about anyone else's needs in this room. But here's what happens, verse 4. So he got up from the meal took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. In other words, he chose to take off the bib and put on the apron. little explanation about this custom. In those days, there was no such thing as asphalt or concrete, and so every road was a dirt road. 
And when it rained, every road was a mud road. And animals and livestock traveled the same roads as human beings did, so that added another interesting element to the mud. And when you were traveling inside a city like the city of Jerusalem, you would typically just travel by foot, and the footwear of that day was an open sandal. So even when you got dressed up and cleaned up and spit and polished, for an event, by the time you got there, you may have been in really good shape, all except for one thing, your feet. And so foot washing was a very, very important part of the culture in that day. And it was especially important if you were going to a dinner gathering, if you're going to have a meal together. Because in those days, when they ate a meal together, they didn't sit in upright chairs at tables that were three feet high. A typical table in that day was 12 or 18 inches off the floor, And when people ate together, they reclined. They kind of stretched out on the floor. And if you were in a small room, your feet could end up perilously close to someone else's face. And so foot washing became a very, very important custom. And so in in a typical Jewish home, right inside the door, there would be a pitcher of water and a basin. Typically, it would be the job of the youngest child or the lowest ranking servant to wash the feet of anybody who came through that door. It was a humiliating task. No one wanted to do it. So here's what happened that night. One by one, every one of these men walked through that door and walked by a pitcher of water in a basin. And nobody said to themselves, hey, you know what? Maybe I can be the one tonight to wash the feet because somebody's got to do it, so it might as well be me. Now, there was another very interesting detail about what happened that night in the midst of their conversation. The Gospel of Luke adds this intriguing spotlight. Chapter 22, verse 24, Luke writes this. He says, Also, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Like, I'm his favorite. No, I'm better than you are. No, I'm going to write a book of the Bible. You're not. Yeah, but when that painting gets painted of all of us, I'm going to be right next to him. You know, I don't know what they were talking about, but they're all debating which of them was the greatest. And so everybody wanted to be in charge, but nobody wanted to be a servant. There's a room full of proud hearts and dirty feet. And let me tell you this, when you get a church like that, where nobody wants to serve and everybody wants to be in charge, let me tell you what, after a while, it just begins to stink. And so Jesus steps in. And he does what nobody else was willing to do. He wrapped himself in a towel. He knelt at the feet of every single one of his disciples. And he washed the dirt from their feet. And I would imagine that at that moment, all the arguing over who was the greatest, that immediately ceased. And there was a hush in that room. And I think they felt very convicted. And this had a much greater effect than any lecture he could have given them. So Jesus makes his way around the room. He comes to Peter. Peter, of course, has to speak up. Verse 6, he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? In other words, you're the most powerful man in this room. No, the most powerful man in the world. You should not be washing feet. You are the son of God. This is not something you should ever be doing. And Jesus replied, verse 7, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand No, no, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. I mean, Peter does not like this at all. See, this isn't how the system works. This is not how things were done in that culture. People in authority did not serve others. Other people served them. And I think one of the reasons, and this is just conjecture, but I think one of the reasons why Peter didn't like this idea is because he didn't want to be held to this standard. He didn't want to have to be this kind of leader, a servant leader. And to verse 8, Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. In other words, Peter, if you're not willing to accept this kind of servant leadership, you can't be part of what I want to accomplish in this world. And so Peter, in typical fashion, he says this, well, then not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Eventually, Jesus finishes Washing the feet of every man in the room, including the one who would betray him, including the one who would deny him three times, including all the rest who would run away in his hour of greatest need, he washes their feet. And then he sits down and he explains the significance of what he has just done. Verse 12. 
When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. In other words, now that I have laid aside my pride, now that I've set aside my position and my selfishness and put on an apron, you have just lost every excuse for doing the same thing to one another. Verse 15, I've set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. In other words, his point here is inescapable. He's saying, listen, if I'm willing to serve, and you call me master, and you call me Lord, and I'm willing to serve you, then you certainly ought to be willing to put on the apron and serve others. I thought about a a conversation I had a few years ago with a pastor who uh, used to lead a large church in Cincinnati. His name is Steve Shogren. And uh, he and his church decided they wanted to show the love of God in a very practical way to the people in their city. And so as a church, they just started doing random acts of service all over the city. And one of the things they would do is they would actually go into a, a restaurant or a place of business and they would offer to clean the restrooms for free. I mean, that got people's attention. Well, he ended up writing a book about this experience. It's called Changing the World Through Kindness. And he tells what happened to him one time when he was in Dallas working with a pastor friend of his in the city of Dallas. He said this, I was able to shine the light of God's love into significant darkness recently while cleaning toilets with a pastor in the Dallas area. We entered an Islamic grocery market and offered to clean the toilets to show God's love in a practical way. The manager surprised me by firing back in a Middle Eastern accent, we have 12 toilets. If you want to show me the love of Jesus, you can start by cleaning all 12. He says, I've cleaned as many as three commodes at a business, but 12 would take an hour or more. How about three toilets, he said. We have more places to clean today. He wouldn't budge. If you won't clean all 12, don't bother cleaning any of them. I could see my toilet negotiating was getting me nowhere, so I gave in. But as we walked back to the bathroom, he shifted gears. You know, we really only have two toilets. I was giving you a test to see if you were for real. Hey, you want to know if your faith is for real? Here's how you can know that your faith is the real thing. When you're willing to take off the bib and put on the apron and serve other people. I would say it this way. If I could summarize everything that Jesus said in explaining what he had just done, I would give you a simple four-word phrase. It's this. Save people, serve people. Saved people, serve people. Now, you'll notice it doesn't say on the screen, saved people should serve people. Because whenever we say we should do something, that means we ought to, but we really don't have to. Like, you know, I should lose weight. I've been saying that for years. That means I I probably won't, but I know I need to. You know, I should spend more time with my family. I should do this. I should do that. But should oftentimes never becomes actual action. So we're not going to say save people should serve people. We're just going to say this. Save people, serve people. That's just non-negotiable. In fact, let let me show you that right from the pages of the Bible. Ephesians chapter 2 where Paul writes to the believers in Ephesus in in that first century city, he says this, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And then almost immediately after that, it goes on to say this, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Like if I could sit down with you over a cup of coffee and have a conversation with every single one of you individually, One of the things that I would say to every single follower of Christ is this, that you are way too valuable to sit on the sidelines, that Jesus Christ paid way too high a price for you to just be a spectator. You are gifted to do something. I I read something very interesting uh, a couple of months back around the Christmas season. Probably most of you got some gift cards for Christmas this year. In fact, little survey, every campus, raise your hand if you got at least one gift card for Christmas this year. Pretty much everybody. How many of you still have gift cards from Christmas that you've not yet used? 
Yeah, most of us. Here's what's really interesting to me. They say that out of the billions of dollars that people spend on gift cards every year, about $6 billion worth of gift cards go completely unused. They get lost. We forget we have them. They expire. Whatever happens to them, they never get used. Now, isn't that the height of ingratitude if somebody would give you a gift card and you never use it? Let me tell you what the height of ingratitude is in the eyes of God. When he redeems you and rescues you and gives you an incredible set of talents and abilities and gifts and time and health and energy, and you never quite get around to using it. See, saved people serve people. Now listen to how this passage ends, verse 17. I I love this closing sentence here. He says, now that you know these things, you will be blessed. Oh, it doesn't end there, does it? Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Yeah. And by the way, to be blessed, that simply means to have joy. That means to have a life that's really fulfilling. And the best way to have a life that's fulfilling, to experience authentic joy, it comes from giving yourself away. Again, I would summarize verse 17 this way. Real blessing is found in wearing the apron, not wearing the bib. That's where the real blessing is found, wearing the apron, not wearing the bib. That's where real significance is found. That's where spiritual growth is found, by the way, when we get beyond ourselves and begin to serve. And I've seen it over and over and over again. When people engage in something bigger than themselves, when they use what God has given to them, they begin to serve. They begin to grow spiritually in ways that otherwise would never have been possible. I've got two daughters. They're both teenagers. And both of them serve in different ministries of this church. And I'll tell you what, uh, I am so glad that we have a student ministry that believes that one of the best things we can do for our kids is get them serving. So they learn at an early age that the world does not revolve around them and that they have something to offer. So I've got a, I've got a 17-year-old daughter. She leads a small group of about 20 first graders at, at, at the Dixon City campus uh, Sunday mornings. I've got a, a 13-year-old daughter who um, helps to lead a group of preschoolers at the Clark Summit campus on, on Sunday mornings. And I'll tell you what, honestly, those serving opportunities have been one of the greatest catalysts for spiritual growth in the lives of my kids. I mean, it's amazing what it does to them to actually get involved, put on the apron, and serve. Because here's why. Real blessing is found in wearing the apron, not wearing the bib. And let me tell you, the opposite is true as well. I've seen that Christians who are not finding ways to serve, not finding ways to give back, it begins to have a negative effect on their hearts and their lives because you become ingrown, you become critical, you become unfulfilled. But let me tell you one other thing that happens in this church when you begin to put on the apron, when you begin to serve. Suddenly what's going to happen for you is this church is going to feel a whole lot more like family. And you're going to begin to build relationships here because one of the things, and I mentioned this a few weeks ago, one of the things that happens sometimes is I'll be out in the community, I'll run into somebody, and they'll say, yeah, I used to go to church there, but the church got too big for me, to which I always want to respond, have you ever read the book of Acts? Like 3,000 people came to Christ and joined the church in one day. Like we're not even close. But whenever somebody says that, you know, the church is just too big, um, that tells me two things. Number one, you're not involved in a small group, and number two, you're not serving. Because people who get connected in community and people who begin to serve, the church doesn't feel big anymore. They begin to build a sense of relationship and community. In fact, I I met a Marywood University student last uh, Sunday. I was hanging out Dixon City campus, and we met, sent me an email midweek just to tell me a little bit of her story. Came from a very different church experience, and, uh, but in the middle of the email, she said this. She said, I've started serving with guest services every week now instead of every other month, and I'm loving it. I know PHCC, Parker Hill Community Church, is big, but once you get in there and start meeting people, the community is amazing. So that's another benefit. See, you put on the apron instead of the bib, it'll change you. So let me say this. To those of you who already serve, let me just say a great big thank you. And that's hundreds of people on on our three campuses. And if I could sit down individually and have coffee with you and just tell you how much I appreciate what you do here, I would do that. But I can't do that. So let me just give you a big verbal pat on the back. 
And uh, if, if we had to pay every person who volunteered here, it would be hundreds of thousands of dollars. But the, the people who put on the apron, they are the people who make this happen around here every week. Now, for many of you, honestly, today is the day when you need to take off the bib and put on the apron. Take a next step, find a place to serve, because I believe you won't become the person that God is calling you to be until you follow in the footsteps of Jesus and become someone who's willing to serve. So let me point out two things that are in your bulletin this weekend. I want you to go ahead and take them out. One is a bulletin insert. It looks like this. It says, serve somewhere at Parker Hill. Go ahead and take that out. And also inside your uh, bulletin is a connection card that looks like this. Take that out. Have that in front of you as well. I just want to walk you through this. And I want to point out to you that there are lots of opportunities for people who want to find a place to serve. In fact, right now, we have 166 different opportunities waiting for you. 166. Let me show you how those numbers break down by area. Guest services. Let's talk about that because you may not be ready uh, to teach or to lead a group, but you may have the ability just to be friendly and make somebody smile. And let me tell you what happens. Many, many people make up their minds about whether they will ever come back to this church before they even get in a worship service by how they're greeted, by how they're assisted, by what kind of uh, vibe they get by the people who first encounter them when they're in the parking lot and walking in the doors. So we need 52 people who are willing to serve in what we call guest services. And you may be one of those 52. And we've broken it down there by campus for you. Dixon City, 30. Clark Summit, 11. Wilkes-Barre, 11. It's broken down that way. How about worship team? Some of you have a musical or technical ability that you are keeping well hidden. And we don't know about it. And I'll tell you what, we've got some incredibly talented people. Everybody who leads music and plays an instrument and sings, it's all volunteers. But uh, we need about 25 more people who are gifted that way. And, and if, if you would serve in that way, that would be a huge difference maker in the lives of people. Or groups. Uh, maybe somebody has invested in you and nurtured you and mentored you, and it's time for you to turn around and make that happen in someone else's life. And we need about 22 people who can lead community groups in homes. And some of you are capable of doing that. And you could be an incredible blessing and really help people grow spiritually. Let's talk about uh, Mungu Land. Mungu Land is uh, our, our ministry for kids who are from zero to five years old. And I think one of the most fulfilling things you can do around here is invest in the next generation and know that you are making a difference in the future by touching the life of a child right now. We don't just do childcare around here. We don't babysit kids. We teach them truth at their age level that, that they can understand and will carry with them for the rest of their lives. So we need 17 people who want to work with preschool kids. And then a step up from there is what we call Epic Kids. Again, one of the greatest investments you can make is to invest in the lives of the next generation. 22 people who could serve with Epic Kids. Student ministries, that's grade 6 through 12. And you might say, well, you know, I love teenagers, but uh, what if they ask me a question I can't answer? They're teenagers. That's what they do. They ask questions you can't answer. And besides, you don't necessarily have to be the answer to all their questions. You just need to model for them the way and love them and help them. And if you want to get plugged in there, we will help you succeed and work with kids in a way that really fits your giftedness. We need 15 people there. Ministry support, if you like to serve behind the scenes, we need 13 people there. So there are all kinds of opportunities, all kinds of opportunities for you to take off the bib and put on the apron. And if you're ready to take that step of serving, if you're ready to stop being a spectator, and start being a contributor. Real simple way to do that. Under next steps on the back of that card, all you need to do is check the box that says, I would like to serve somewhere. And then you can jot down a couple of possibilities there, two or three possibilities. Someone will contact you and will help you navigate that and get plugged in. But you're going to have a few minutes to fill that out. You can take it out to the Welcome Center in the lobby, uh, or you can just hand it to one of your campus pastors, and we will be happy to help you get plugged in and serve somewhere. Now, let let me help you understand something. This is not about volunteering for something. This isn't about us filling slots. It's not about you having your name on a list. It's about all of us together fulfilling a mission. 
Because whether you greet people in the parking lot, change diapers in the nursery, fold bulletins, lead a group of elementary age kids, or lead a small group of adults, whatever you do, it's part of something much bigger. It's part of helping people who are far from God find the way back to God by creating a relevant and compelling church experience and, and, and distributing truth to them in a way that they can understand and creating a church experience where they can say, you know what, I love my church. And here's what so many people say, yeah, I, I should do that. I should. I'm so busy. Like my kids' sports and my work is so demanding and home life and I'm just busy. I understand that. Life is busy. In our culture, everybody's busy. And do you know when things are really going to slow down and you won't be busy anymore? When you stop breathing. That's when you won't be busy anymore. But until then, we've got to navigate the busyness in the context of our lives and prioritize the best things over things that are simply good. And I don't want you to get to the end of your life and realize that you've missed out on some of the most important opportunities there are to do something that's going to matter for eternity. In fact, let me say this. If this isn't a church where you feel that you can get involved, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to find another church. I mean that. Because here's the thing. If, if, if this isn't a church where you feel comfortable plugging in and using your gifts and abilities, I'd rather have you serving at a different church than sitting in this church. Because that's unhealthy. And it isn't following the example that was set for us. Because after leaving that upper room, Jesus subjected himself to the greatest servanthood that history has ever seen. He walked out those doors. A few hours later, he was arrested. He was taken to a cross. He was crucified. Eventually, left behind an empty tomb so that he could not wash our feet, but so that he could wash our hearts and make us whole again and give us a hope and give us a future. And that's the real motivation behind serving others. Not out of guilt, not out of shame, not to check off a box on a spiritual to-do list. We serve because we have been served so richly and so deeply. And if we are followers of Christ, that's the example that's been set for us. So please, 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 Take off the bib and put on the apron. And today as we end our time of worship together, we're just going to be reminded of the servant heart of our Savior as we celebrate communion together. There are two tables at the back and two tables at the front of the room that you're in. And on every single table, there are two things. There's a plate with some bread wafers, and there's also a cup with some grape juice in it. And that bread is a powerful and tangible symbol and a connection with the body of Christ. And that juice is a powerful symbol and a tangible connection with the blood of Christ. That body that was pierced by the nails of the Roman cross and the blood that flowed down those timbers so that we could be forgiven, we could be set free, so that our sin and the weight of all of that was put on Him. And we were given, instead of shame, forgiveness and righteousness the ultimate act of servanthood that history has ever seen. 